Well, it was very, very interesting because the way I structured it, first I had to divide them into groups, and they had no choice in the matter. Um, I had a diverse group. I had some students who are taking courses with me before, so they know my style, they know the expectations. There were some students who I've never seen before in my classroom. Um, most of them were, uh, I think the youngest one was a second year student, so there were no first year students, which was good because they would have been difficult for first year students. But some were fourth year students and they had background in Japanese history, that, so they knew something. Some knew nothing about Japanese history. Some are Japanese language students, some were not. So very diverse group. So within the first two weeks, uh, I just set out to get to know them. I was lecturing a little bit, but I, I got to know them. And I took notes and, and had certain characteristics I wanted to have, you know, uh, where they came from, because we have some international students. Uh, I wanted to mix them with Canadian students. I want to have a, an appropriate gender mix in each of them, experience mix. I even asked them, have you been to Japan before? And I made sure that every group had someone who had been uh, in, to Japan before as well. So by the end of the two weeks, when I knew that the, the class was somewhat settled and I knew how many students I had, I simply said, uh, here are the, the, the four groups. So once the group settled, um, they then had to make two group presentations uh, to the class. And so those would be lectures, basically, on the city that they had choose, uh, chosen and also some period in history. Everybody had to do something that was basically pre-modern, and everybody has to do something that was modern. So they had to do both. Those were lectures. So that was one particular audience. So they had to kind of think about how to give lectures. It was very, very interesting. Um, you know, I've given lectures for a long time. Um, I only gave five in this course in total. Um, but they were actually paying attention to how I was doing it rather than just to the content, which they normally don't do. So that was very interesting. And so they gave lectures and we actually had the other students give them some feedback so they could uh, figure out if they did well, if the message came across, was the pitch of the message right, right? Because they have a particular audience. Now the purpose behind that was actually to, to communicate to them the importance of the audience. Because they had a classroom audience that had some familiarity with their topic. In the final group projects, the audience was completely different. The audience is the online audience, the, an online audience that is interested in, in Kyoto or Tokyo, but has no background in it. So now they had to change the pitch, right? Um, and it was more to generate interest than, than to convey only information. And so if I go from the beginning, the, the first one on Kyoto, um, this is where they used Minecraft to recreate the, uh, the palace area in Kyoto with you know, amazing accuracy, but also developing it as a game where you would go through certain quests to learn um, you know, little tidbits here and there about the culture at that point. The modern one on, on uh, Kyoto was, was very, very interesting. It was a story of um, foreigners, two foreigners coming to Kyoto and wanting to kind of have a tour of the touristy areas, right? And, and, um, and they kind of use some stereotypes, you know, some you know, typical uninformed Westerners coming in. I won't reveal any more than that, but, um, and, and they had them kind of walk around and, and always start with different places. They started with a, a kind of a stereotype, right? So, uh, 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 for example, about Zen, something about Zen, right? And, and then they had two guides who were Japanese who were following along and showing them around. And then giving them a different narrative, giving them a different answer. Well, you know, in fact, Zen was not, you know, really all that tightly connected to the warrior class the entire time. It was mostly the warrior elites who did this and, and all of that stuff. And, and so they were being very, very informative, but at the same time they were walking around in modern Kyoto, so you could actually replicate it if you went to Kyoto and then already know more than the, the general tourist would. Our project was a video, uh, is, is a video project. Um, we thought of doing a video project with a uh, puppet doing different kind of motions and we would voice over it, use uh, different kind of visual effects to bring them to different part of the uh, city we're doing, which is Kyoto, uh, actually modern Kyoto. We took them to different uh, landmarks or places where we're going to talk about. And then uh, this was more of a, um, a kind of a role play game type of thing where um, you would visit Tokyo and uh, they, they made the setup very interesting. And uh, um, so you basically come to Tokyo. You, you are playing the game against you know, the, the computer. And um, you lost your wallet. And uh, there are five people in the subway cart. 
and you need to ask one of them, and so you make a choice, right? So this is one of those games where, you know, depending on your choice, you know, the game may develop in a completely different direction. So if you think about it this way, there are five different characters. There were five people in the group, so they all made one character each. Um, but then you have to have like a number of options, and so for every choice you make, of course, you're going to get off in more choice. So, so imagine the amount of work that goes into creating those different. And so throughout your, 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 kind of your, 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 your quest for your passport, you know, you're taken through many different districts of Tokyo, and, uh, um, and they show that in the classroom by having the students play it. Um, I ended up playing it, and not only did I lose my wallet, I also lost all my money because I went in into completely the wrong area, and, and and got taken for a ride there. So, and, I mean, and just the innovation of that was just absolutely amazing. Um, and then we had the the early one on 18th century Edo, um, which was a, an absolute brilliant idea of of pitching a a um, a kind of soap uh, drama series to a Hollywood producer. Um, and of course, they had set it in uh, Yoshiwara, which happened to be the pleasure district in, in Edo, uh, which of course gives us a certain twist. Um, uh, and they, they did a long, it's like a 45-minute episode. Um, they wrote out the entire script. In fact, I do have the manuscript. They wrote out the entire manuscript. They had character cards, so you could see what the, who the characters were. And every single name they gave to those characters are you know, thought through to the minute detail. So they're taking names here and there from history. And you know, many people may not know it, but those who know a little bit, ah, I see, that's why he got that name. So they have thought through every single aspect of that in order to try and make it a, as a kind of, from their perspective, as accurate as they could and still make it interesting in terms of developing this kind of the soap opera thing. My co-leader uh, was sitting there and he was like up all night. It was 3 a.m. He was lying in his bed. And he was the one that had the idea of coming up with a soap opera. See? Now that you mention it, I see a man in the middle. Is some kind of auction? Oh, 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 oh wait, wait, wait. I want one. Yeah, just sit back and watch. You might learn a thing or two. Um, and then, you know, without me knowing it, uh, by the end of the course, uh, someone had created a, a separate website entirely dedicated to this course um, to share just uh, broader. And so to see someone do that, you know, above and beyond the course is fantastic. Um, now, it, it does bring me back to something else. Uh, you know, my goal with this course is, of course, to keep teaching it. And, and my hope is that, uh, you know, we can have a number of different narratives uh, and maybe on that particular website that she created um, so that maybe in a year or two I will have a new uh, crop of students that will create different narratives. And, and so you, you have a whole kind of a library of, of, or an archive of different narratives of Kyoto or Tokyo. And so, you know, people could go out and see them. And then at the end of each of these presentations, um, you will see there are actually credits. And they have actually listed the bibliographies. So, so what's different between these particular narratives, of course, that they actually have so they actually have footnotes more or less, and said, so here's where we find the information. If you're interested, here's where you can read it. So it is a narrative that is used in the most common voices for you know a large generation and for billions of people, uh, but also used in the more kind of traditional historical sources to, to ensure that they have tried to recreate something that from their reading is probably more accurate or more appropriate for that particular period than a kind of a pure popular culture production that doesn't actually have that background. We wanted it to be interesting just on a base level, but also like kind of intellectually stimulating for people that aren't. Because I mean, um, I don't understand this like mutual exclusiveness of oh, it's either going to be entertaining and everybody's going to love it, or the academics are going to hate it. Why can't you have something that is appealing to general audiences, but also doesn't tick off the academics? We try to put a lot of humor in it, because our understanding is that once you make your project very academic, very informative, a lot of people would go to sleep when they were watching it. A lot of people wouldn't be with it, but we made a lot of stereotypical characters in our video, and we made fun of them. And it, it was a lot of fun doing that, and I think that caught that catches people's attention better than just telling them exactly what's going on. So with the project, we were trying to correct the misconceptions on ancient uh, Japanese history and cultures that was m misrepresented by a lot of uh, pop culture today. 
I think that's the one, I don't know if it's a problem or a hurdle sometimes with um, academia, is that you know, it's, um, there's a barrier when it comes to being able to take information and make it fun and make it real and make it real world, make it um, something that's like entertaining and informative. And just knowing that your work is gonna be out there, uh, being commented by people, being critiqued on by people, uh, you take your work a lot more seriously and you actually try to make it uh, really, really worthwhile for other people to watch as much as getting a grade for it.